Speaking as someone who's done some writing in my time, very amateur writing, of course, I find myself sympathizing with the writing of this episode. It reminds me of the episode where they did the big payoff back in season one. You know the one. I, I pointed it out when we were there. Um, this is the episode that really starts to finally unfold an enigma that's been present quite literally since the very first episode, the Vorlons. Now, obviously, we don't have all the answers today, but this really feels like an episode that was mostly constructed specifically to examine the Vorlon situation, because by this point in time, the whole Clark thing, that's not news. We know Clark... The Let me say that quickly. We know the Clark administration are bad guys. We know that they have control of the intelligence community, community and military, and we know they're evil. I mean, there's, 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 this is not news, right? So the only real reason... To, uh, to to really go forward mystery-wise is for the Vorlons. Now, um, I do like how they not only bring it to your mind, but they explain about as much as they leave for questions, which is, which is a good way to keep an enigma going. We learn that the Vorlons have their whole organosynthetech. We, ha we understand that they... This is the first real conversation that ever happens with a Vorlon in this episode. So that's kind of a hallmark in and of its own self. Mo most of the times before, they would say, like, a single sentence or whatever. One of the things one of my viewers pointed out, and he was absolutely right to do this, was the fact that in one of the earlier episodes, uh, Deathbringer? I can't think of the name of the episode. It was the episode where they were being offered, you know, the eternal life serum in exchange for the lives of others. You remember that one? And at the end of it, the Vorlons just kind of killed her, abstractly, and said, you're not worthy of this. He pointed out, and he was very correct to point this out, that was in every way a declaration of war. That was an act that if another species, if the Centauri had done that, or if the Narn had done that, or if any of the non-aligned worlds had done that, that would be a very aggressive move that, even if it wouldn't directly lead to war, would lead to hostility between the two powers. But because the Vorlons did it, everyone was okay with it, because they're the Vorlons. Everyone's terrified of them, in addition to the ridiculous level of political power the Vorlons display, right? Which is funny. But despite all that, the Vorlons don't really talk that much with us, with anyone else, actually. And yet, as Sheridan points out, the Vorlons have, uh, Kosh in particular, has been more present during meetings ever since he came on board. And, and this is an interesting one to me, he actually talks with Sheridan. Now, everything he says makes sense in hindsight, uh, the second time viewing or the third time viewing or whatever. But the first time view, admittedly, it seems like nonsense. But even without the advantage of hindsight, if you pay attention to what he's saying and how he's saying it, you can see that he's basically thinking a few steps ahead with each sentence. In other words, he won't answer the question he's being asked. He will answer why he's being asked the question. He will skip forward in the conversation to get to what he believes to be the end point. And I like how Sheridan flat out gets a, pro pro uh, a reaction out of him by asking, What do you want? I'll talk more about that. Uh, never, because I don't think it'll ever come up again. I'm kidding, it'll come up later. But we'll talk about the question later. <sighs> um, there's... Uh, it's funny because there's a lot of focus on the Vorlons in this episode in terms of structure, but I don't actually have that much else to say about them. Now, let's talk about the whole other side of things. So, they're going after the gentleman who is, you know, the, 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 the medical individual who is aware of the fact that Clark faked an illness in order to get off of a ship just before it was destroyed, putting Clark in power. Now, that by itself is not damning evidence. It's pretty bad looking, but it's not actually, you know, a smoking gun equivalent. But it is, as they say in this episode, a start. The relevant point, initially you might be tempted to think that Clark and his administration are being very foolish with this. They show in rather brazenly and flat out say, our orders are to go after this guy, shoot to kill, no questions asked, he's terrible, and blah, 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 blah. Which feels like they're showing their hand too much. Like they're already pre presenting themselves as the police state they want to be, right? That isn't actually true if you remember what General Haig already said to Sheridan, and the fact that, that, that it is portrayed in this episode as well, the people on the Clark administration's side think Sheridan is one of them. He may not have personally vouched for Clark or anything like that. However, he is definitely uh, being presented as someone who thinks in their direction. They think Sheridan is a member of the Clark administration. 
And Sheridan himself plays up that role. He is helpful more than a few times in this episode. He does smack the gentleman, what's his name? I wrote it down. Um, Cranston. He does smack uh, Agent Cranston down a few times. But then immediately after doing so, he, he says, now let's go ahead and start working on the actual problem here. I actually love the scene towards the end of the episode where he flat out says, you have made a mockery of my station and turned me, my entire station upside down looking for someone who was never here. You assured me he was here. And we have just proven that he is not here. However, we will now do everything in our power to ensure that we will assist you in your continued search, blah, 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 you know, that kind of a thing. So still part of the line while still being the hardline officer that they view him to be. In other words, playing perfectly to the role. I like that. And it is actually quite smart. It also uh, reminds me of something else. In typical television, this wouldn't be necessary. You know why? Because in typical television, we know who the bad guys are because we know that. We're the viewers. We have access to information they don't in-universe. So we know the Clark administration is a bad guy. In fiction, nine times out of ten, if not more, th if, you know, if the circumstances happen where one person happens to be absent and then this person dies and this person benefits from it, it was a plot. So we can assume from the beginning that there's something up with Clark and his administration, right? But Babylon 5 is presented as a believable universe, one that has its own rules and existences and all that fun stuff. And ergo, they need this really horrible thing called proof. Now let me tell you something really horrible about real life. Proof is tricky. Actually coming by proof is one of the hardest things you could ever do. And if Clark was actually covering his, his ass properly on this one, there really wouldn't be any proof. It is actually kind of funny because they give the reason in this ep episode why this doctor has not vanished before now. They flat out say it's because of the fact that if they, they erased him too soon, it would look too apparent. Instead, they kind of give him the impetus to flee, giving them ex an excuse to go after him. And so they kind of clumsily say, oh, you know, go after it, because Sheridan's on their side. There's no need to, for pretense. There's no need to pretend. Sheridan's already on board with the program, right? Sheridan even convinces them in several ways this is the way this is going to work. It is actually Ivanova who's the only one who actually shows any real open hostility towards, uh, towards him over the course of the thing. You know, the, the sort of disdain uh, kind of a situation. <sighs> There's some good suspense in this episode. I like the fact that the mystery about Jacobs and what's going on with him is very brief and then pretty much immediately it's all laid out there. Here's all the information for the audience's sake. You know, the people in the universe obviously still need to figure things out and still need to prove it, as I mentioned earlier, in, some, in other cases. But the audience knows everything that's going on fairly quickly. That was actually a good move, in my opinion. Holding on to mystery too long is always something that's a little tricky. I've talked about this before in writing. And usually you need something to replace that mystery. And in this case, they went with a degree of suspense and dread. First of all, the suspense is obvious. It, they are actually basically walking a very tight tightrope. It would have gone extremely badly for everyone involved if they hadn't successfully gotten Jacobs out. Imagine for a moment, if you will, if Kosh had not had such an interest in Sheridan as to allow him to basically carry him on his ship. Think about that for a moment. Think about how horrible that would have gone. Now, furthermore, <laughs> the dread. Why is there so much dread in this episode? Think about how broad and sweeping this act really is. This is actually foreshadowing. This will get worse in the future. I don't feel I don't mind telling you that. But this this is the Clark administration doing something for basically the first time. They're really stretching stretching their muscles. They're expanding their might. They're showing what they can and will actually do in service of their own ends. This is the first time we've really seen them in action in any meaningful sense. And they walk in and they basically take over Babylon 5 temporarily, but still and you know, sh shout orders and nearly track down a man on a station like Babylon 5. Five miles of complicated integrated station and they still nearly found him. That's crazy. And it kind of shows the resources and power the Clark administration actually has. And that's where the dread comes in because the moment you think about that... <sighs> um... There's some really, really, really good human interactions between Franklin and Garibaldi. Again, the anti-padding that I've referenced so many times. I also like Garibaldi's quote, I don't believe anyone. <laughs> now do you believe me? No, I don't believe anyone. Oh, it must be terrible we lived. Oh, it's good rant, it's good food. Um, that, does, that line is rather flippant. 
And yet it's absolutely true, isn't it? That is Garibaldi now. Before, he had his elite sect of people he trusted. And then he was shot in the back by one of them. Now, he has his elite sect of group that he mostly trusts. But he doesn't actually trust anyone. That lesson scarred him, and he has carried that scar now, and he now is in that state where he doesn't trust anyone, and I sure hope that doesn't come up in the future, because that would be horrible. Imagine what it would be like with the detective mind and the resources and the competency of Garibaldi turned against our main characters. <sighs> wow, I have, like, no notes. I, I want to talk about something real quick. The whole point of my show is not really a review. It's more sci-fi debris thing. He kind of goes through the episode, talks about the concepts in it, and he's funny. Uh, me, I try to analyze and discuss the episode itself, its connections to its greater lore, and, of course, to discuss the creation that went into it, you know, the actual creative process, the meta side of things, if you will. That's more my bag. And every now and again... Uh, I find myself watching or playing a work, and I'll go for fairly long periods of time with nothing to say. Uh, this is probably most apparent if you've watched any of my Then and Now segments. Uh, the Zelda 1, Zelda 2, and Zelda LTTP, as well as the Earthbound seg segments, are probably the best examples of this. Because those are effectively solo lore runs. In other words, I'm doing a lore run just without the interactive element, which kind of sucks, but you know, there it is. Um, discussing the game as I go through it. And there are huge, huge, huge gaps of time where I just have nothing to say. I you know I, I, I have nothing to add. I have nothing to give. This has actually been a problem during you know live lore runs as well, which is one of the reasons I like the interactive elements so we can chat about stuff or discuss things or whatnot. You know, some of my viewers, of course, challenge my views, which is great. And we come up with new ideas, you know, that kind of a thing. But it's weird when I'm doing one of these standalone videos, the features, as I like to call them now. Um, and I'm sitting here and it's like, I... I'm watching the episode, and I'm enjoying the episode, and I look down at my most recent note, and I realize my most recent note was like 10 minutes ago. Because I have nothing to say. Um, I, I, I don't know what else to do other than apologize for that. Because I'm, I'm not going to just make up stuff. I'm not going to start padding it. You know, I'm so against padding. But I wanted to, 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 to explain that from my perspective. How it is for me to be the person sitting here watching the episode and just having nothing to say. It's not always that happens. It's actually kind of rare. But every time it does, I notice it. And I'm just like... And, and I, I don't want to just say, well, this is good, or this is good, or this is how this character interacts with each other. That's in the episode itself. You could just go watch the episode and get that out of it. So, I guess I apologize, because I got nothing else to say. We'll see you next time, guys.